very first time in, uh, in chapter 16, and we'll touch on that in just a minute, but let's look and see what we have. And if you'll notice, I'm going to start at verse 3. You know why? Because verses 1 and 2 are full of difficult to pronounce words. So if you look at your Bibles, you'll see all these words. I think, mm, I'm not sure how to pronounce them. Anyhow, the Philistines and the children of Israel were in difficult to pronounce places. Okay, but they end, and some of you are looking at it right now. Okay, but we're going to begin with verse 3. So the Philistines come first. So the Philistines and the Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. So now you know where the title comes from, right? Victory in the valley. That's where the title comes from. And then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath. Keep that in mind. So two times in, in chapter 17, it talks about uh, Goliath, the champion of the Philistines. That word is used, okay? He came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. And then we're going to jump to, we'll come back to his description. Let's jump to verse 8. Goliath stood and he shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? Because they came out, came out and stood in a line, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they lost their courage and were deeply shaken. Oh, there is so much in this passage for us this morning. And as we look at this, uh, we're going to see what Saul, we're going to see how Goliath is described in just a minute. But I want to encourage you because again as I said, this is going to help us don't worry about all these little dwings, ding, dings or whatever. It's our it's our recording. Okay? That's okay. We'll get it worked out. Wait till he gets that going again. You nod at me when it's going again, Keith. Okay. Um, so remember, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, okay? And Goliath comes out, and he says, look very carefully, he's a champion. He says, you're only the servants of Saul. And he says, I defy the armies of Israel. And when they hear this, they lost their courage and were deeply shaken. So as we come to this, I, I want to encourage you very specifically this morning as we think about facing an obstacle, as we think about the trouble that we are facing. As you think about some of the things that you are dealing with right now, it may be fear of the situation, the health si situation right now. And some of, you, some of you may really be struggling with this. Others of you may be, uh, it may be a family member, a husband or a wife. It may be a child that is just grieving your heart and you're trying to work it out. It may be a health situation. It may be finances. Um, for some of the young people, I know they're, they're upstairs now, it may be struggling with what these circumstances in Hong Kong are going to do to their, what it will do to their education as they're looking ahead. It can be any number of these things. To me, as I was thinking about the battle with David and Goliath, for me, I framed it in terms of this, whatever it is. Anything you and I face that feels overwhelming and that feels larger than we can handle, it's just bigger than I am, there's no way I can, uh, there's no way I can handle this, there's no way I can face it. To me, it fits into this category. And I think that covers most of us, either this morning or at some other times. And so this is the situation, and so this is where we are. Uh, David is not part of this story yet, but as I said, if we go back and if we look at uh, chapter 16, uh, David has been introduced to us, and I'm not going to look at it for sake of time, but you've got your Bibles with you. In chapter 16, uh, Saul was the king, not David. Uh, Samuel, the prophet, the man of God, has been, was led by the Spirit of God to go to a, the town of Bethlehem. And in the town of Bethlehem was a, a man named Jesse. We don't read about the, the wife at all. She possibly had passed away. There's no mention of her. Um, they had, he had eight sons. So with eight sons, in that society of that day, he would be considered greatly blessed. Greatly blessed. I, imagine having eight sons. And um, Samuel goes to the house of Jesse, and God says, from one of his sons is going to come the new king. And we know the story, right? 
the sons come, they pass in front, and Samuel, even though he's the man of God, uh, he doesn't really see with God's eyes in the beginning because he wants to anoint son number one, son number two, or son number three. And God says, mm -mm -mm -mm. basically God says, Samuel, what impresses you doesn't, or what impresses man doesn't impress me. I'm looking at hearts. And that's not even our message today, but brothers and sisters, God is still the same. Our outward things, our outward accomplishments, honestly, brothers and sisters, we stand on them, don't we? We hold on to them. We treasure them. We feel that these things give us worth and value and standing. God looks at our hearts. He looks at our hearts. That's what's important. And so God tells Samuel, no, there's one more. And then he says, this is the one. And we don't even know what's in David's heart in chapter 16. All we know is God knows. And he says, this is the one I've chosen. And when chapter 17 comes, we begin to see the heart of David revealed. Even though we don't know anything about him except he's a young, good-looking guy. Um, parents, for those of you that have... Uh, Teenage children, teenage sons, this is a great encouragement to you. The words that the Bible use here, he talks about a youth and he was a boy and things like that. Almost certainly, David was a teenager. Really, he was a teenager, probably maybe mid-teens, something like that. So, um, after he is anointed king, guess what David does? He goes right back to taking care of the sheep. I don't know about you, but if I were anointed the next king, I'd get the big head. I would say, okay, sorry, I'm king. Some of you other brothers, you go take care of the smelly sheep. I'm going to stay in the house. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do inside work. I'm going to whatever. But David goes right back to taking care of the sheep. And, um, and he goes on to what, he, what he's doing. And in the meantime... Uh, his three oldest brothers go off to war. And this is where we come to this story. So when we read this part of the story, although it doesn't mention the three older brothers, the three older brothers are there and they hear Goliath shouting uh, his taunt and his defiance uh, to them. So uh, we come to this and um, they lost their courage and they were deeply shaken. And uh, now you and I know how the story ends, right? Who wins in the end? Who, who gets hit in the middle of the forehead and who gets his head cut off? Goliath. I didn't, did I, did I spoil the story? Spoiler alert. <laughs> A little bit too late. We all know how the story ends. So, so um, but when we come to this, we see this great fear. Now, before we blame the Israelites for their fear, let's look at, let's, let's look at what uh, Goliath is like. He was over nine feet tall. Have you ever met anybody over nine feet tall? I don't know, who are the tallest basketball players? Yao Ming is what, seven foot something? Okay, yeah, is anybody older? Who's, who's anybody taller? Any basketball f fans here? Say seven and, seven and change. That's about as tall as you get. Here's, here's Goliath, he's over nine feet tall. And it said, we don't know how much over, but he was over nine feet. He wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. <laughs> 125 pounds is more than a lot of you weigh, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not, it's not more than I weigh anymore. At one time, it was. So just, his, just what he's wearing, just that part. He also wore bronze leg armor, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam. That's not Goliath, by the way. It's just an example. <laughs> Tipped with an iron spearhead. Just the, just the spearhead was 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. Basically, Goliath was a champion MMA fighter of the Philistines. Those of you who don't know what MMA means, what is it? They fight in a cage. Mixed martial arts. Right? That's what MMA is. I hope I don't offend anyone with these, with these pictures, but it kind of gives you an idea of the ferocity and the, and the uh, fearsomeness of what, of what Goliath must have been like. I don't know who this guy is. I think this guy is British. Conor, Conor McGregor? I... I'm <laughs> 
<laughs> and, and, and since I'm an equal opportunity preacher, I put a woman up there too. <laughs> I'd be scared of her too. Um, now, I'm not trying to make light of it, but it, it does give us a little bit of an idea of the... Uh, it makes it a little bit more real to us. I really mean it. I, I really mean that. Um, here's this champion that comes out and he's taunting them. And that really is, that would be very much what it was like. Now, so while all this is going on, meanwhile, Father Jesse wants to make sure his three sons are well taken care of as they are fighting bravely in the valley against the Philistines. So he sends David, who's been anointed as king, uh, as an errand boy. He gives him roasted grain, he gives him some bread, and he gives him some cheese. I like that. A care package from home. And he gives it to David, and he says, David, go take this to your brothers, find out what they're doing, and bring back a good report. Because Jesse, in his mind, it's like, my, my three oldest boys, I know they are winning glory on the battlefield right now as they're fighting the Philistines. Jesse doesn't know that his three oldest sons are running in fear every time Goliath comes out and roars at the, ar uh, roars at the Israelite armies, right? And so that's what we come to. So David brings the goodies uh, to, the, to the camp, and then he runs to the front of the battle lines to find his brothers. And so this is where we come to. Let's get those ugly pictures off. <laughs> okay. So he's talking with his brothers, and um, Goliath came out twice a day. He came out in the morning into the valley. That's where the battle was going to be. He came out in the morning, and he came out in the evening, late afternoon. And so probably it was late afternoon. As David was talking with them, with his brothers, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath. There it is again. Now it's the, actually not two times, the third time that this word champion is used. Keep that in mind. Came out from the Philistine ranks. And then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. As soon as the Israelite army be, saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant? The men asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. So they go running, but what is the response of this teenage boy? David asked the soldiers standing nearby, Who is, what will a man get for killing, this, for killing this, this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? And then look at what he says next. Now here's some words for us that we're going to come back to. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Hmm. If you are a little bit frightened this morning, this should encourage you. Let's get into the encouraging part now, okay? So as we look at this and the battle, I want to talk about three things this morning. And the first thing, if you are in a battle, if you are in a conflict, if you are facing something that feels overwhelming to you, whether it is outside of you, whether it is within your family or in your own body or in your mind, here are some things that will help you as you fight the battle and face your giant. Number one, understand the battle, okay? Understand the battle or know what the battle is. You can think about it any way you want to, but understand the battle. And we've all heard sermons on this, so I don't want to re-preach sermons that we've all heard. I want to come at it from a slightly different perspective this morning. You may say this morning, Pastor, don't condescend to me and don't patronize me. I know very well the battle I'm facing, and you don't. You don't know what battle I'm in. Stay with me. Let's look at it. Let's look at it together. So what, does it mean, what do I mean when I say understand what the battle is and what's going on? What I want us to understand is this, and there are many things we could say, but what I want us to see in this is when you are in a battle and the enemy is against you, the enemy is always lying to you. And that's something I want us to see this morning. The enemy is always lying to you in any battle. Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Whatever the conflict is, whatever you're facing, I don't care if you do have something wrong in your body this morning. Some of you may be fighting, there's something in your body and you know it. You may have a child that is hooked on drugs. You may have a husband or a wife that's in bondage to something else and you say, but it's real. It's real. This is happening. I understand that. 
I understand that. But what I want to say to you this morning is, in every battle you face as a child of God, there is a component that you do not see, and it is the enemy at work lying to you. Always, always he's lying to you. If you want to look at the story, look at the story. You will see some lies right away. If you look at 1 Samuel 17, Look at, I'll, I'll go ahead and give you some right now, and you can look at more than this. If you'll look at verse 8, when Goliath shouts out to the challenge, almost the first words he uses, they're lies. He says, are you not the servants of Saul? Now, it's true that they were the soldiers in the army of Saul, and Saul was the king, but remember, these are the Israelites. These are the people of God. These are the people of God. This is God's army. This is God, this is God from beginning to end. But what does Saul say? Are you not Saul's uh, sorry, what does Goliath say? Are you not Saul's servants? Lie number 1. Lie number 1. Lie number 2. This day I defy the ranks of Israel. You say, "Well, that's not a lie." Goliath is defying the ranks of Israel. Almost always, when there's any conflict, an enemy is lying to you, there'll be a mixture of truth in it. There'll be a mixture of truth, and you'll feel like, oh, yeah, 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 it's true. Why? Goliath is standing there. He's shouting out defiance to the armies of Israel. And what Saul, and, and sorry, I keep on saying Saul, what Goliath says is, I'm defying the ranks of Israel. But as we're going to see in just a minute, that's a lie. That's not really who Goliath is shouting his defiance against. That is not really the person, that is not really the one that Goliath is defying. When the enemy is at work in your life in opposition to you and there's a battle going on, he will always, listen, he will always try to limit your view of the conflict to what you can see and to your resources and to who you are. He doesn't want you to see what the bigger fight is. He wants you to see flesh and blood. He wants you to see that person. He wants you to see that situation. And he wants you to see your resources. And he doesn't want you to see anything else. It's a lie. Now, how do you know that there are lies when you're in a battle? How do you know that there are lies operating? Well, I just said to you, the enemy's always lying. He always is. May I say this to you? It, even if, and I want to be careful here, but it's true. Even if at times we are in conflict with other Christians, the enemy is trying to lie to us. Always. Always. Look at the next one. You want a sure sign of lies being effective in your life? If there is fear. If there's fear. Now I want to say something this morning, and I don't say this in condemnation. But if you are struggling with fear, this morning in your heart, in your life, about a situation, about something you're trying to overcome, I promise you this is a sign that the enemy is lying and that the lies are taking effect in your life. I, I, I promise you that. Now this, I don't want you to be discouraged, I want you to be encouraged because when you know the enemy is lying, you can do something about it, right? And I'm saying this very specifically because I know some of you this morning are struggling with fear. A few months ago, I was praying about something. It was something I've been praying about for quite a while. You know, all of us have short-term, sudden, acute things that we pray for, right? And then all of us have things that we've been praying over for a long time. And I was praying about something that I had been praying about for years. And the only way I know, the only thing I can describe to you is this: as I was as I was praying about it, I suddenly felt fear just begin to overwhelm me. As I was praying, I, I was thinking about it. I was praying about it. I was talking to God about it, and it was just as if waves of fear just began to roll over my heart. And the more I prayed, the the bigger the waves got, and it I, I felt like oh, it was overwhelm it was overwhelming me overwhelming to me and I was so fearful that my heart started beating faster. I, I, have you ever felt that before? You start thinking of, of things like that um, and my heart just started beating faster and, and I, I just felt like I was choking almost like I, I couldn't breathe. 
And I'm so grateful and I'm so thankful, not because I'm such a smart Christian, but the Holy Spirit was helping me. That's what the Bible says in Romans 8. The Holy Spirit helps us to pray. And the Holy Spirit helped me to see it's a lie. It's a lie. This is the enemy right now. This is the enemy right now. And so I thought, okay. And so I just kept on praying and I kept on praying. And I just started, I started saying, this is a lie. God, I know you will. And I just began, I just began saying all the words of God that I knew to overcome. And after a while, the fear subsided. The fear, now all of us have faced that before. But if we don't know any better, the fear can overwhelm us, can't it? It can keep us awake at night. It can bring disease to our body. Any of you that have dealt with fear for any length of time know what it does to you. You know what it does to your sleep and to other things as well. And so a sure sign of lies at work is fear. If you're, if you're struggling with fear this morning, some of you may be, may be fearful about what if I get COVID-19? What if this and what if that? And if there's fear in your heart about that, the enemy is lying to you this morning. The enemy is lying to you. But we're going to... But we're going to defeat the lies this morning. Let me give you some examples. When Saul, so, uh, uh, so Goliath shouts, look at verse 11. When Saul and the Israelites heard these words from the Philistine, they lost their courage and they were terrified. There's a sign, right? Um, and so fear is at work. And then a little bit later as well, when David is out there standing, look at verse 24. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in great fear. Have you seen the giant? The men asked. He comes out each day. Uh, they, sorry, just that far. They, saw him. they began to run away in fright. Okay? So, so we know, so we know, okay, so lie, we, the enemy's trying to lie, and here are the lies. We know that the lies are working because fear is taking over the Israelite army. Okay, let's go a little bit further. A lie is working. How do we know when a lie is working? When there's fear. And we know that a lie is working in our lives when the lie comes out of our own mouths. Okay? you got to stop agreeing with the enemy, brothers and sisters, and so do I. And you say, what do you mean a lie comes out of my mouth? I'm trying to... You know what? Sometimes you and I think things about situations and about people, and it feels like it's coming from us, and it comes out of our own mouths, and it's from the devil. But because it comes out of our own mouths, we don't think of it as from the devil. We just think it's from me. I'm thinking this. I'm that. The enemy is at work. You want me to give you some examples? You say, can you specify? Yes, I can. Look at this. What, look at verse 25. Have you seen the giant? The men asked. He comes out each day to defy who? Israel. Israel. Now as we're going to see, and if you're reading the chapter already, you'll see that's a lie. Did you know it? It's a lie. Because Goliath is not really defying Israel. Go ahead. Let's go ahead and get the answer. We're going to come back to it. Who is Goliath defying? He's defying God. He's defying God. But what do the men say? He's defying Israel. He's defying Israel. What happens? What does the enemy do? He, he lowers the gaze. It's this way. He's defying us. You see, if it's kept at that level, it's the resources of the Philistine. It's Goliath against us. We can't overcome. We can't overcome this. He always wants us to, he always tries to lower our gaze. You want another, you, you want a, another lie that comes from the mouth of God's people? Look at what Saul says. David goes to Saul and David says, let me go after, don't worry any, don't trouble yourself. Let me go after this uncircumcised Philistine. I'll kill him. And what does Saul say? You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for you are but a youth. And he's been a man of war from his youth. Here's the king himself. And he's, and he's saying a lie. He's saying a lie. You know what? You say, well, what do you mean that's a lie? If you go a little bit further in this chapter, if you read in verses, I think it's around verse 40 or something like that, do you know what Goliath says when David comes out to fight him? Remember that? Goliath looks at him, sneers at him because he is a boy, and he says, Am I a dog? You come out here with sticks? I'll take your body and feed it to the birds and to the whatever. Lies. And here's Saul, here's Saul bringing out the lies himself. So if you and I, are, if lies are coming, we don't think it's a lie. We think it's true, don't we? We think it's true. But here we have this at work. Okay, let's go a little bit further. De so we go back to it. Understand the battle. Understand the battle. The first lie, Goliath is not defying Israel. God, Goliath is defying 
God. It's the armies of the living God. That's what David says. David says he is defying the armies of the living God. David says it three times. And I want you to be encouraged because you know what? As you're in a battle and as you're fighting, sometimes you're going to have to stand and fight with your words. You're going to have to make a stand. And it may take more than once. It may take several times. David says to the terrified soldiers, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He's allowed to defy the armies of the living God, not idols not gods, because a little bit later Goliath is going to swear by his gods, but David says the armies of the living God. Number one. Number two, to King Saul. David says, I'll take care of him. I'll kill him just as I've killed lions and bears. I'll do it to this uncircumcised Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And then finally, to Goliath himself. What does he say? You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Here's the truth now. The God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. And brothers and sisters, here's the truth. Here's the truth. This battle is a defiance against God himself. It's against God himself. It always is. It always is. And the enemy is fighting. And he's fighting. He's defying God. He's defying God. And David, I love this, because David says this right before he kills Goliath. Okay? Right before he kills Goliath. So three times David says it. So number one, understand the battle. Understand the battle. Number two, understand or know who you are. Okay? Understand and know who you are. So um, if, you, if you don't like that phrasing, understand, you can say know who you are if you, want, if you want to do it that way. Who are you? Who are you? Well, David says it first. He says, I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. And when, when in the Old Testament, when it says the name of the Lord Almighty, it means in, in connection with, I, I'm representing Him. It's not something I take on myself. I, I'm coming against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. And when it is the name of the person, it is who the person is. It is what He is. It is all of that. And David said, this is how I come to you. I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. So I want to encourage you this morning, brothers and sisters, if you are in a battle, I don't care what type of battle it is, it is not you alone alone against your Goliath, whatever it is. You are standing, you are fighting, you are claiming ground in the name of the Lord Almighty. Get your eyes above your limited resources. Get your eyes above what you don't have. Get your eyes above what you cannot do. Get your eyes above the giant in front of you that's been roaring and taunting and say, you'll never win. This situation will never change. There's no hope. What use is it? You've tried and prayed and nothing has happened. That's a Goliath who is taunting and defying the living God. And when you stand and when you go forth, you are going in the name of the living God. You're not on your own. It's not, although, although the Lord fights through you, if you will. It's not your battle. It's the Lord's battle. It's the Lord's battle. I, oh, if I could, I, I, I hope I'm communicating that clearly. I want you to be encouraged this morning. For me, as the Lord was, work, was, was as I was preparing yesterday, I was so encouraged. I was so encouraged for myself and for the church and for you as well. David understands who he is. And when you and I understand who we are, who we are, we can face that Goliath in front of us without fear. We can stand our ground and we can take ground. We can take ground as well. Remember the first lie? Remember the first lie? The first lie was, you are servants of Saul. Oh? Remember that? You're servants of Saul. Are they servants of Saul? They're not servants of Saul. They're the armies of the living God. That's what Saul was trying, that was what Goliath was trying to do. Get them to think, oh, you're just, look at Saul. See, you're his servant. And he's Saul, and Saul was a big guy, apparently. He was a big man, and apparently had been very brave up to this point. But even Saul was afraid. 
to go out and fight the Philistine Goliath, the giant. And when Goliath says, oh, you're servants of Saul, oh, you're not a servant of Saul. Listen, you're not a servant of Saul this morning. You're in the, you go in the name of the Lord God. You go in his name. Amen. Amen. So know who you are. In this battle, because the armies of Israel didn't know who they were, there was no way they could win this battle with, with Goliath. All they could see was, they have a nine-foot champion. We don't have anything like that. All they could look at is, this is our, our king is not even. Our king, the big guy. And, and Saul, uh, I, you could go back and read it. I believe in the old, it, it says in the earlier chapters that Saul was head and shoulders, right? It says that Saul himself was head and shoulders above, above others. So maybe Saul is seven feet? I don't know. Maybe he's seven feet? Saul was afraid to go out. You've got to know who you are and whose you are. You've got to know this. Because if you don't, if you don't, you will never look beyond yourself. You'll never look beyond your resources. You'll never look beyond your own abilities. You've got to know who you are. You belong to God. You have God's resources. I was thinking about this yesterday. Because the enemy will always try to make you look only at what you have and what you can do, and at your pocketbook, all of these things, at your amount of grace you have for a situation, or patience, or, or whatever. And I was thinking about this. In any battle, and in every battle, who you are, who you are, cannot be separated from who God is. Because you're His child. You're His child. Never let the enemy separate you from God as you think about God's resources and who God is. When there's a battle, God is with you. He goes with you. You're not on your own. It's not your own resources. I was thinking about this because I was thinking about Lighthouse yesterday. And you all know last year we talked about some of the finances of Lighthouse, changes in the economy, and there were changes in some things. And as some people had left Hong Kong, uh, we had a squeeze in the finances. And the board began to look at, okay, do we need to tighten our belt in this way and that way? And brother, and, and it's good to do that. We want to be accountable. We want to handle the business of things, and we want to handle the finances. We want to handle those things in the right way. But brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something this morning. In anything that we face, and in what Lighthouse faces as well, if we look only at our own resources, and that's all we look at, we are the same as the armies of Israel in the valley that tremble in fear when Goliath comes out. I mean it. I mean it. Look around you at this church. Look around you at the people. There are those who are sitting here this morning who were here in the beginnings of this church. And you, and many of you who came along later, were part of the miracle of God in making this church what it is. Those of you who were here in the beginning, if you had looked only at your finances and only at your own resources, Lighthouse would not be here today. It wouldn't be. Lighthouse wouldn't be here. You and I would be somewhere else. Some of us would not even know the Lord this morning because you came to faith in Lighthouse. The churches of the Philippines that are there probably would not be built this morning. Why are they there? Because God made a lighthouse. God took a handful with slim pocketbooks and he spoke faith into their hearts. And he said, look to me, not to your circumstances. And God built a church out of a small group of people who were faithful and who were obedient and who were sacrificial. And he made something good and big and wonderful and for God's glory out of it. Never be limited by just what you can see with your natural vision, what you can see with your own eyes. Our God goes far beyond that. Our God is an uncountable God, an immeasurable God, an omnipotent God, a mighty God, and you are with Him. Never separate 
who you are from who God is as you go forth in battle, as you face things, as you overcome things. God is with you. Do you have a grievous heart this morning because you have a loved one that is in bondage or far from God and you feel like, I can't. I've done everything. This is the time to look to God. Don't separate yourself from God. God says, but I still love that child that you have almost given up on. I still love that, that husband or that wife or that relative that it seems impossible for it to work. God says, I'm with you on this. You're not alone on this. I, I'm with you. This battle that you're facing, this physical, this health struggle that you're going through, I'm with you. You're not on your own. You're not facing Goliath by yourself. I'm with you and I am the living God and I'm the captain of the armies. Amen? Amen. 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 How's my time? Oh yeah. Sorry, we're gonna have to keep on going for a while. We we gotta get to we gotta get to Goliath dead, right? Don't you think so? We gotta get to Goliath dead. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're gonna get to Goliath dead in just a minute. I'm <laughs> getting so you gotta know who you are. And don't separate who you are from who God is, okay? Look at this also. Understand who you aren't. When you know who you aren't, that will help you know who you are. Remember what I said? Pay attention. I'm going to speak. We're going to go really quickly now. Two times David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? It really sounds like an insult, doesn't it? It's like, ooh, <laughs> you know, it's really rude. But I want, you to, I want you to look very carefully at these words. Now, we're not Jewish. We don't have a Jewish religious background. But these words are really important for us this morning. Really important for us this morning. Two times, David comes out and basically to put it in modern, in modern language, basically David says, who, do you, who does this guy think he is? He's an uncircumcised Philistine. He's not scared. Do you know why David says this and why he's not afraid and why he's amazed that all of Israel's armies are afraid? David knew the promise of God. David knew the covenant of God. David knew we are the children of the circumcision. David knew we are the people of the covenant of God. The circumcision was a mark of the covenant. And it was an outward sign, but along with it went an obedient and a faithful heart to God. And David knew we're God's chosen people because we are following Him. We have a covenant with Him. And because of that, we're living in the blessing of God. We're blessed by God as we go into this battle. So David stands there and he says, you're scared of this guy? He's an uncircumcised Philistine. God's curses are upon him. That's what it means. God's curses are upon him. Now, God's curses are not upon other people. You understand that, right? This is the Old Testament example. But it helps us to see the black and white line between who we are and who we aren't. And what you need to remember as you face difficulties, as misguided Christians will sometimes say to you, Oh, you must have done something wrong. God is punishing you. Oh, well, you have to whatever. Oh, oh you're being judged because of whatever. Baloney. Now, are there things that God deals with in our lives? Yes, God does. But you are children of the covenant. You are the children of the circumcision in the New Testament. So much better than the Old Testament. And it's all about Jesus. And it's all about grace. Here it is. Um, Moses, right before he, he dies, and right before they go into the promised land, it's just, a, it's just a brief example. He says, today I've given you the choice between life and, and death. That's the covenant or not the covenant, right? Between blessings and curses. That's the covenant. And then he says at the end, he says, you can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying Him, committing yourself firmly to Him. This is the key to your life. And if you love Him and obey the Lord... This, this is the, and then it goes on from there. This is the key to your life. I encourage you. Now, this is Old Testament, but what I want to say to you is this. The New Testament agreement with God, relationship with God through Jesus Christ, is so much better. So as you go into battles and as you face obstacles and as you work to overcome, keep this in mind. You're not living, remember we talked about this a few weeks ago? You're not living in the year of the rat. Remember? You're living in the what? The year of the Lord's favor. The year of the Lord's favor. So as you struggle with these things, 
don't let the don't believe the lie of the devil that God's angry with you, that you've messed up and he's punishing you, that you deserve it. You're living under the new covenant. You're living under the blessing of the Lord and the enemy and the battle that comes against you. Basically, it's 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 living under God's blessings or that's under God's curse. So you can come to that's that's who you are. That's who you are. And very quickly, finally, as we close, as we close, hang on just a minute. This one's fast. Understand who your champion is. You already know, don't you? Understand. Or if you like it better, say, know who your champion is. The Philistines knew who their champion was. He was Goliath. Says it three times. Our champion is Goliath. Understand who your champion is. David says, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Whom you have defied. And then he says, today, what does that phrase say? Say it with me. Today the Lord will conquer you. He's our champion, brothers and sisters. He's the champion. You aren't the champion, I'm the champion. We're tempted to say, well, Goliath was the, was the Philistine champion and David was the Israelite champion. Not, not so much. The champion of the Israelite side was God himself. You got to know who your champion is. And David says, and I will kill you and cut off your head and I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals. And you know what? I, I didn't include it because I, I knew our time would be short. But what's so great, you go back and read it on your own. Just before this, Goliath the liar, because the enemy's always a liar. You know what he says to David? I will give your body to the birds and the beasts. <laughs> a lie. You know what David says? Because he knows God. He doesn't let that lie go into his heart, fill him with fear, or influence him. Instead, he turns it around. What does he say? I will kill you, and your armies will be given to the birds and to the beasts. We counter the lies of the enemy with the truth of God. It's not our own bravado. It's not our own courage. It comes from God, and it comes from His Word. So get in the Word of God. And oh, I love this part. Don't you love this part? This, the Lord will conquer you, and what? The whole world will know there is a God in Israel. Boy, that should put some fire in your bones this morning. There is a God in Israel. Let the world know there's a God who lives in you this morning. There's a God who lives in you. And then... He finishes it up, and here it makes it so clear. Know who your champion is. And everyone assembled here, God's people and the Philistines, will know that who? The Lord. Who's the champion? The Lord. Rescues his people, but not with sword or spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is the battle, brothers and sisters. Understand what the battle is. Know what the battle is. Know who you are. Know who your champion is. Who's your champion? Jesus. Jesus. What does he say? Be of good cheer. I have conquered the world. I have overcome the world. What else does he say? Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. I want to ask you to close your eyes and pray this morning. If you have been battling fear, if you have been not too bad. Just a few minutes after. I went really fast at the end, but I want to pray for us this morning. And Panina and the, uh, and the backups and the musicians, I want us to sing again, uh, Praise the Lord, Our Mighty Warrior. Uh, it may, may not be everybody, but some. In just a minute, we're going to sing that. You can just start playing if you want to. But I want to pray for you, and I want you to pray. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you this morning? You've heard that before. What is He saying to you? And I can ask you that because 
I didn't find this message in a book. I didn't say, well, what shall I do or whatever. The Lord spoke it to me. And then as I was preparing, the Lord made it so clear. This message is for us this morning. It's, it's for me this morning. It's for you this morning. So, Lord, we come to you this morning. And, God, we come to you based on... On your word we thank you Lord that you have given us examples in the Old Testament that are very clear and physical so that we can understand the spiritual battles that we face Lord we thank you that you help us to see through your word what the battle really is and God some of us this morning we we as we look at our own hearts and as we look at our own responses God, we see that the enemy has been lying to us and we've been believing the lie because fear has been filling our hearts. And I don't know this morning if you want to, you see there can be a spirit of fear. I don't know this morning if some of you, I want to pray for you if you are really, you've been battling fear in some area. If you want to just raise your hand right now, we're going to pray specifically about that. Sure. I see some hands. Others, okay? Others, okay. Anybody else? Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. I see those. Ha I see your hands. Okay. I see your hands. Okay. I see. I see each hand. This is what we're going to do right now. I'm going to pray, but we're going to pray. We're going to pray for some other things. Let's pray for our brothers. Probably about 15, 20 people raised their hands for fear. It may be somebody near you, and you may know it. But right now, fear is from the pit of hell. It's from the devil. It, by by fear, he traps us. By fear, he he binds us up and, and, and renders us ineffective. But you have a champion. You have a champion. Lord, let's pray right now. Let's agree together right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we stand on your word. And God, we declare you are our champion. We declare that you have overcome. We declare that you are more powerful than the, the lies that the enemy has been whispering to us and that have been filling our hearts with fear because it seems so reasonable. What if this happens? What if this happens? In the name of Jesus this morning, oh God, we stand against this fear and this spirit of fear and these whispers of fear or these arrows, these darts of fear. We stand against them. We stand against them. We take up the shield of faith. We take up the shield of faith. You have given that shield of faith to us. You have put it in our hearts. You overcame. Oh Lord, you defeated death and hell. You went to the cross. Oh, for us to overcome and you live in us. And so this morning, oh Lord, oh Jesus, our champion, would you go out and fight that en enemy? Would you go out and fight the champion that thinks he's big standing in front of us? But you are greater. You have overcome. And we speak in the name of Jesus. I speak against every lying spirit, every spirit of fear that is trying to work in the hearts of people this morning in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I ask your, that your people may strength and courage rise in their hearts. May they reject the lying voice. May they push back against the fear. And God, if it comes again, Lord, give them strength and courage and persistence to stand and to keep on standing, to speak and to keep on speaking. And Lord, may they take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. That means it didn't come from God. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a, a sound mind, a controlled mind, a controlled mind. Lord, may this be the heritage of your people this morning. We thank you, O Lord. We thank you, O Lord. We understand the battle. We thank you, O Lord. We understand who we are. We go with you. You go with us. We are your child. We're not our, not our own, not with our own resources. We are not the uncircumcised Philistines. We are children of the blessing of Jesus. Hallelujah. We are living in the, in the light of your smile. We are living in your favor. You have good plans ahead for us, not to harm us, but to prosper us, to fulfill hope and to give us future in you, in the name of Jesus. And Lord, finally this morning, we set our eyes upon you. We understand who our champion is. 
you are our champion. Honey. And we honor you this morning. We acknowledge you this morning. We extol you this morning. Oh, Lord, when giants rise up against us, Lord, we will laugh. You are our champion. You are our champion. May we set our eyes upon you and go forth and win a victory in the valley. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.